Today I have the pleasure to host Wojciech Przybielski, political analyst heading the Visegrad Insights Policy Foresight on European Affairs. In the book, uh, he co-authored Understanding Central Europe. Uh, Wojciech basically tried to explain this region to the Western public and why Western theoretical models failed to explain its complexity, if I can put it that way. And this is what we will, in a way, try to do today as well, to offer a deep dive into the contemporary politics of Central, Eastern Europe and the Balkans, and to try to predict what is going to happen in this region in the following period when it comes to geopolitical alliances, war in Ukraine and EU politics, with a particular focus, of course, on enlargement and the future of democracy. Wojciech Przybielski is a political analyst heading Visegrad Insights policy foresight on European affairs. His expertise includes foreign policy and political culture. He is the editor-in-chief of Visegrad Insight, president of the Respublica Foundation, as well as Europe's future fellow at Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna and Erste Foundation. In 2017, Wojciech co-authored the book titled Understanding Central Europe. He has been published in Foreign Policy, Political Europe, Journal of Democracy, and many others. So uh, Wojciech, um, in the October 2023 parliamentary elections, the ruling party of law and justice, PIS, was unseated after an eight-year long reign. Can you tell us how did this happen? Well, that, that would be a long story and I think uh, worth a, a whole episode. But first, let me thank you for the invitation, Serjan. It's a real pleasure to have a conversation with you and, and to be on the video uh, with, uh, with your audience. The elections in Poland uh, are of paramount significance, uh, not only because um, they demonstrated that it is possible to win after eight years of democratic backsliding, I wouldn't even call it backsliding because it uh, assumes involuntary movement away from democracy. There was a state capture attempt with deliberate tactics of undermining the opposition and undermining democratic process understood as a possibility of peaceful transition of power. So when this transition of power happened, when the when the elections were won, everybody scratched their heads. How was it even possible? Because everybody said it's a tilted uh, playing field. There is, um, there, there was no uh, equality in the media. There was no in the public media space. There was just smear campaign against the opposition leader. There was, um, there was so much uh, that could go wrong, including the question of migration, including many questions, and yet it didn't. And uh, although the ruling party, formerly ruling party, was the first um, in terms of the popularity, in terms of how many votes they, they scored, um, the coalition of parties that were opposing PIS dominance have formed a co coalition government and by the end of the year they, they are, um, they are in now in power since uh, December 2023. It had two essential components to cut the story short. And again, that's not all of the story, but two points that I would mention. And one is a personal dedication of Donald Tusk, who has the, who has against the smear campaign and against the, the tide of hatred against him, went into direct door-to-door, uh, -door, big tent events in small, medium constituencies across Poland and invested over two years of his time touring, talking, listening, and demonstrating he's not what uh, PIS uh, portrays him to be, and mobilizing, energizing the opposition overall. So it had this leadership figure, and leadership cannot be underestimated here. Leadership is essential to winning elections, and that is coming with a bulk of tactics, methods, marketing, you know, the, 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 the playbook that is observable in all other elections, but it needs a clear leader who sets the tone of the discussion. And Donald Tusk did it early on by saying this election is about being in Europe or being outside of European project. And for that, I mean, since that moment, he basically 
was consistent in building the narrative, building the, the message, strategizing coalition, building, because he said the big priority is right and uh, he could communicate with the public. On the second, second point is that these elections was more lost than won by PIS, who was unable to utilize all the resources they have had. They made tremendous mistakes when it came to, uh, for instance, uh, exposing themselves as a party that is fighting migrants and at the same time there was cash for visa program organized within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, basically it blew into their um, faces during the campaign uh, when it was discovered uh, the, the inconsistencies, the lack of coordination, the internal infighting between factions of the group rendered their ability to set the tone and set the uh, perspective on why they would uh, need to win the, the next term, uh, simply not convincing for the rest of the public. So we had unprecedented turnout, mass mobilization of youth and female voters. Also there were these big uh, civilizational questions, you would say, about who we are as democracies, as societies, that brought people who care about them, sometimes even more than anything about anything else, to the ballots. And that, that gave the final result. Yeah, we'll come back to that and also to um, Donald Tusk. And uh, there is uh, more than you can imagine probably of uh, allegory in what you're mentioning uh, that uh, the Serbian listeners would um, basically uh, listen to this and think about our own situation. But I will not deliberately invoke this now. This is really now about Poland. But I wanted to ask you that many in our region that suffer from the creeping authoritarianism of our own postmodern hybrid dictators looked with excitement at the 20th of December police storming of the Polish public news channel. Uh, an attempt to how the new Polish government argued restore impartiality uh, and uh, many observed this here as a symbolical beginning of state decapture in Poland and uh, can you tell us a bit more about this would you say that uh, free media and media pluralism is the first step in the state decapture process and how do you see this process further developing in Poland? Sure. I will, um, I will say this, that first of all, there was no police storming the, of, of the headquarters of the public media. Police was protecting uh, the public media offices from being taken over by violent protesters. I don't know how it, this message uh, flew in the internet. There was, there was a very... Um, very ef efficient, I think, communication of the PIS, Law and Justice Far-Right Party that was in government, they immediately switched from Polish to English and they started to describe the situation uh, that was happening on the street in terms of the, exactly, police, brutality, uh, breaking of the rule of law, kind of, you know, they, they thought they were re reversing the narrative. But I, I think the facts on the ground that are pretty well established were that the government took unprecedented steps in replacing the management board of the public TV. They uh, utilized legal grounds for that that is still be, have been questioned and is being questioned, but has been accepted subsequently by the court system in Poland, in which the government um, basically utilized also the fact that the uh, president has vetoed uh, in the budgetary uh, law the elements that would fund the public TV under the new government. And this was the direct pretext uh, for an intervention on the grounds of commercial conduct, not to, uh, not to allow the company simply to go bankrupt and to undergo a certain restructur uh, restructurization process. So under the commercial code, uh, these actions were taken, they, they, were, not, uh, they were not conducted as an operation that would be um, basically in any sense illegal or forceful, except that politicians of the PIS did not expect that. They thought there is no legal grounds uh, or there will be no uh, path, which eventually turned out there was, for, for the takeover. The media, the, cent the central element of that is, however, uh, facts. 
facts that were distorted and abused over the past eight years, let's say six years, um, when PIS took over the uh, public TV and radio. And while taking it over, not immediately, but, but a few years, uh, just two years after, setting a top politician uh, as the head of, the, of this channel, they made it effectively into a propaganda channel that could be a likened to what we have used to see, what we used to see on Fox uh, News. Um, what Fox News was uh, in its worst days of, of the past. Maybe it's not such a bad TV uh, these days. Uh, after se several uh, court cases and, and reforms they had to conduct on their own. But initially they were a smear campaign uh, political platform to fight opposition day and night. Um, and not providing uh, the grounds for uh, explaining the facts and delivering the public mission uh, that media are supposed to deliver. So um, that, was the, the, that was the basics, uh, the, 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 the bread and butter, or if you want, of the decapturing of, of the state media to restore um, uh, in the media a sense of dignity for people who are working there, for journalists, whose mission by themselves, by what they declare to be uh, themselves, is to deliver news rather than propaganda and to remove people who are employed there as chief propagandists, uh, those who are basically political marketing, uh, doing political marketing on behalf of the one party that was in power. Yeah, I mean, uh, you would be surprised uh, how in the pro-democracy camp uh, the, the, the police storming, uh, uh, you know, uh, imposed narrative worked against uh, those how they intended it because people were actually excited that uh, you know there was like uh, perceived uh, a brutal response to eight year long um, basically propaganda you know uh, many interesting lessons from what you're saying as well uh, also uh, the the notion the, the 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 result of the election that you say that despite a complete absence of a level playing field. Actually, the opposition managed to win. An interesting lesson uh, to uh, bring back home here. Uh, another question, uh, un uh, and you mentioned this briefly, uh, under the PiS government in Poland, there has been significant social mobilization around issues like abortion, for example. and. Uh, what is the main reason behind the government tabling such issues on the political agenda? Uh, because here, for example, the government does that primarily with Kosovo, you know, World War II, 1990s wars divisions. And there is the feeling that, uh, at least here, symbolical issues such as these are put forward as a smoke screen to cover difficult debates about economy, inequalities, corruption, or to plant a divisive seed amongst the opposition. And I wonder if there are any similarities and um, if you can tell us more about this um, uh, in the case of Poland. First, let me clearly distinguish between symbolical uh, issues in policy and communication that evoke emotions, uh, which are naturally related to memory, memory politics, history, events of the past. And yes, I can re refer to them as symbolic. But in case of abortion, we're talking about even more emotive uh, theme in the public policy that, uh, unlike uh, these events that are purely symbolic of the past, are real life and death matters uh, in terms of delivering healthcare and delivering equality and the conditions of life of people who are citizens of, uh, of, of this country, of Poland, but I think it's universally uh, in every other country. The situation that has developed over the past years in, in a country that has been holding sort of this ambivalent and oftentimes considered a very conservative approach to, the, to abortion that was so-called abortion compromise between the liberal left forces and the Catholic conservative forces from the, from the 90s that has been um, abolished by the previous government and that resulted in legal changes that would result in, in doctors not performing um, uh, their code of conduct as, as doctors, uh, saving lives, 
uh, of, of, the, of their patients, but would um, withhold certain procedures because the, their legal status would not be sure, their legal action, the actions they took were not legally certified, and therefore uh, we had reported cases of, of women also dying in, in, the, in the process because of certain, you would say, medical negligence based on, legal, uh, on, on the legal grounds. So that was the situation. Uh, the situation is not yet greatly improved and the government is only now debating how to ch make the changes in the law having a president of the oppositional camp in power with very strong veto powers. Abortion question is coming back to the stage, potentially dividing or pu putting a lot of tension between the, op between the coalition partners of today. But in, um, uh, in, in, in general public, in, in, in the expectation of the society, this is an issue that needs to be solved immediately because it impairs the quality of, of public care uh, that, that, we, that we are um, experiencing in Poland. So these were, you know, these were life and death stories that um, mobilized people in the elections and still are uh, the topics that um, basically energize the public opinion because it touch uh, members of our families in, in all strata of the society. Uh, so overall you, you, have a, you have still an issue in which with the new government we have some relaxed approach and basically the penalization like lack of, lack of uh, the government initiative in enforcing the regulation but still uh, this issue of uh, legislation is being right now debated. As a matter of fact, this is going to be now the hottest topic in the uh, current uh, season, the political season after local elections uh, ahead of the European Parliament elections, because uh, the coalition needs to agree and it's an, not an easy issue to agree within the coalition, let alone also with the members of the, um, of the former party, which doesn't also, by the way, stay uh, very united on the question, so it's a you know it's it's a very it's a very internal emotive element of politics that that touches basically every uh, every person and begs to ask uh, fundamental questions about morality, the you know meaning of life and and so on and uh, responsibilities. Indeed, um, let's zoom out from Poland uh, for a minute and. Uh, uh, because the formation of the new Polish government uh, gave hope around Europe that the populist wave will be finally stopped and overturned. But then we had uh, recently the victory of uh, Pellegrini in the Slovak presidential elections, the return to power of Fico Smer and the uh, incredible result uh, of Hert Wilders in the Netherlands before that. So what would your predictions be for the European Parliament elections? Um, but beyond that, uh, for some of the major European national elections, namely uh, October 2025, uh, Germany. Well, to, to, I, I, have to, I have to pull my crystal ball right now for 2025 uh, October in, in Germany. However, the, the trend that we see overall in a number of European countries seems to be pretty clear that um, the liberal left agenda is pushed down in uh, response to one particular theme that dominates every country discussion, which is uh, a sense of control over the borders, migration and public services that, um, that uh, creates pressure points and again emotional responses in the society that turn for radical solutions, radical answers uh, more often than not and that also re-evaluate a general sense of priorities in, in, in what, is, what is important and what is to be delivered in in our societies and in our countries. Um, uh, I think the level of complexity and wishful thinking that has existed in the left liberal spectrum of the, of the political parties has been self-defeating. In, 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 if, if you look at the German uh, number of the promises, electoral promises and the coalition even agreements, that, that they are oftentimes self -conf they are conflicting with each other. 
So it doesn't seem like a clear strategic guidance. And against that backdrop, we see a sense of uh, clarity, uh, clarity that I don't agree with, but the sense of clarity is there on, on the side of the, of the uh, far right, uh, which uh, tends to simplify things, uh, but also give a sense of confidence to the voters that there is, there is a sense of strategy and, and priority. The expectation for the European parliamentary elections uh, in this context is that while mainstream probably holds and these camps of mainstream from the uh, Christian Democrats, Social Democrats, Greens, Liberals will probably hold, it will have to take into consideration that especially uh, uh, Christian Democrats will be tempted to maneuver between the mainstream and negotiating certain policies where they would manifest their leadership with the, uh, the non-mainstream uh, parties. Uh, and that will be a completely new game, completely new situation, uh, which uh, many will say, well, it's uh, perhaps an enter entering the realm of real politics in, in Europe, which otherwise has been... Uh, seeming to be a little bit uh, insulated from the trends we have seen already in, in our domestic politics uh, of the countries within EU, but also globally speaking in, in many other countries around the world. Yeah, well, let's maybe see how this uh, real uh, politics plays out uh, on the question of the war in Ukraine and support to Ukraine. This is my next question. Uh, does the electoral success of the populist right threaten to weaken the European resolve in Ukraine? Uh, it's a one million dollar question and I, um, I would see it particularly through the composition of the big groups, big forces within the European Parliament, uh, most of which declare and are committed to building European power. And you see that even with Giorgia Meloni. I mean, you, you may not like her politics, you may not like also her proposals regarding domestic politics, the symbols that also she and her legacy of, of her politics represent. But if you look at the support and the position in Ukraine, that wasn't um, uh, as bad as we have feared. This is not to say that they're leading on the question, that they are the force that would deliver solutions immediately, but that is also to say that uh, such parties uh, not necessarily are delivering uh, pro-Russian messages. And saying that, I also recognize and I re want to come back to what you asked about Peter Pellegrini and Viktor Orban. Uh, Slovakia and Hungary have political leaders um, elected with uh, relatively high support. Both, uh, in both countries, w built around the theme, the political communication, the, the selling message of the, of the last election about war and peace and support for Ukraine fighting in order to win established peace or, um, as of course they would not say this is the purpose, or uh, ceasefire or peace as they say, which means um, annexation of the country and uh, basically uh, allowing for political, if not ethnic, cleansing uh, happening on that territory in, in result. So uh, the appeal of, of such politicians is also the, 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 the kind of charm of appeasement uh, is also very uh, present in European politics. Um, and against that, uh, what we see, and I think uh, look closely at what we have seen from Warsaw recently, there is a diplomatic effort to both still talk to those guys, because their countries, despite this awful narrative, allow uh, for many more things they would not uh, declare to their own uh, electoral uh, groups. But overall, um, the leadership that they do also, because there is a sense of leadership in the European Union with um, many bigger countries that enforce the decisions that are necessary for the higher end, not just Ukraine, uh, although Ukraine here is, is very important, but for the unity and the direction of the European project to be able to maintain prosperity and security on the continent overall 
which is so important for every constitutionally elected, you know, the, 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 every country with, uh, with its democracy um, where, where leaders are elected. So both for individual country and political perspective, but for the, for the prospects of European project overall, this is top priority, top um, uh, question that, that drives leadership and sidelines any decisions that would uh, divert from that for the time being. Let's talk a little bit about uh, autocrats in the Western Balkans and about the uh, so-called stabilocracy approach on the side of the EU, meaning uh, appeasing and tolerating uh, local uh, autocrats for the sake of stability. Uh, in December last year, uh, as you may not have followed, Serbian ruling party blatantly stole the local and parliamentary elections. Uh, th this was not the first time, but this time they were caught red-handed. And apart from being undemocratic, Serbia remains amongst the few in Europe that refuses to introduce sanctions towards Putin's Russia. Yet. Despite hard resolutions uh, from the European Parliament, it seems um, the EU still continues to play on the Vucic card uh, in the region. The current Polish Prime Minister, Donald Tusk, at the time when he was the president of the European Council, called Vucic uh, a friend and even a soulmate. Uh, so uh, what position is he taking now, and you think he will be taking now as the Prime Minister of Poland? And you think overall that uh, what would change uh, this approach towards the Western Balkans hybrid dictators? Right. I, I think it is important that you, you mentioned that uh, while he has been playing party politics a leader as a leader of the European uh, Christian Democrats, um, and embracing Vucic, he has now a bit different role to play when it comes to Polish politics. Polish politics in terms of foreign policy and in terms of its European and also domestic policy has a very clear strategy is to build up our security on all fronts, which starts with military, build up with um, record hard purchases, disinformation campaigns, um, reorganizing the state from within and all these you know rule of law questions the civil liberties questions they are part of the question of how to make our democracies secure security is the key now in in this context and in this light um, any uh, any ally is most welcome and Tusk already named our orientation toward the central Nordic part of, of Europe um, with uh, the second, uh, also very traditional direction for Polish politics, which is Germany and France. Anything else, I mean, there is also a strong link to Czech Republic. Anything else that we have seen in the past, like building some sort of cultural, um, uh, you know, culturally, whatever, pan-Slavic, central European identity, and based on this... Uh, a sand castle to, to explore the, the possibilities of a, of a European project, that is no more. But this is not to say that Poland will not invest now even more into building a new relationship to the countries that are meaningful for Central Europe. Poland has overlooked Serbia. And that's crystal clear um, for, for many years. And even so uh, that, that we have new, new governments, we will see a new attempt on the policy towards Central Europe, towards Hungary specifically, Slovakia apparently too, and Balkans and Serbia. Serbia and Balkans overall uh, were lost from our focus um, for the past, I would generally say, maybe even 20 years, that was under-invested uh, uh, direction of our foreign policy, of our European policy, and while we have seen the spread of, uh, of the influence from Budapest and through, this, through the proxies of Moscow in the Balkans, we have missed an opportunity, uh, that's crystal clear. This is me speaking, but uh, you can find the, the, this logic already uh, coming up in, in, the, in the new apparatus of the, of the government with the restructured foreign policy of, of Poland. There, there is 
going to be a calm, maybe at times moderate, but maybe at times more ambitious attempt to address partners in the Balkans so that uh, from the point of view of Polish interests, which is build security in Europe, we find joint solutions. And in this slide, I would say Serbia uh, comes into the picture and the potential uh, visits, meetings, new initiatives will be built between Poland and Serbia to address what we can do together in terms of security. Would you counsel President uh, Charles Michel set a date for EU enlargement by 2030? In other words, he said that the EU will conduct the institutional reform by then, so that the EU will be ready. So, uh, what is your assessment? Are we going to see enlargement by 2030? And which country, in your view, will join the EU first? I can tell you an anecdote about this, but I want to hear your answer first. Yeah, you will hear a very typical Polish answer, actually very much aligns probably with the previous government as much as with this one. Uh, we can have enlargement because we are perfectly fit to accommodate new members without uh, changing the treaty. We do not uh, need the treaty change in order to enlarge. And we can uh, have many more members uh, of the European Union, including even the biggest ones, uh, including Ukraine, um, which by number of population will compose of just as many who have left. And I mean Brexit. Um, so there is a matter of political will uh, on both sides and not a matter of institutional, organizational treaty arrangement because our union is fit for uh, having new members and getting uh, adaptations along the way of the enlargement. The, uh, the way to enlarge is to actually adapt and through the accession treaty also make amendments, which can, by the way, go very extensively on the question. Now, whether the political will to enlarge will be there uh, on both sides, on, on the side of countries that are uh, applying that they are in the process, and on the, on the side of the European Union, that cannot be guaranteed. But, um, well, look, I imagine that the war in Ukraine, um, the Russian ability to spread havoc and chaos on the West will have its limits. And if there is a window of opportunity that Russia is basically losing this battle, as definitely I wish and many wish uh, in, in Europe, uh, and they are forced to retreat and offer a pause on their end with Ukrainians gaining ground, this is a moment when we will see unprecedented steps just as before, um, in, in such a context, Europe will rush forward to uh, secure the new status quo, which will be uh, about security, both in the Balkans and in Ukraine and Moldova or whoever else tags along in the process. If there is a continued war effort in which we are um, undermined by Russia, including Russian oper operations in the Western Balkans specifically, then uh, I am afraid that we will be um, diverting from the path of enlargement. I mean, the, the real discussion we should be having, what will happen if no enlargement happens? Also to mobilize the political um, uh, leaders, but also to be prepared simply for a situation in which uh, this whole process of enlarging will be dead. And uh, I would not exclude that this is a real possibility because of lack of leadership um, and not because of the treaty changes. So I know um, I'll repeat the question. Uh, thanks. Uh, I know uh, us think tankers don't like these questions like that. They seem superficial, but uh, you were into foresight. so. In all likelihood, uh, by 2030, are we going to see a new enlargement? Yes or no question? Yeah, I'm betting my money on yes. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I would as well. And uh, I, was, I will tell you, I would not ask another difficult question like that. Uh, in a course uh, I was uh, holding, I had a guest lecture, I would not name him, but uh, 
he is uh, one of the former top, uh, let's say, EPP uh, people. And uh, uh, he got the question, uh, which country will uh, join you first from a Montenegrin uh, student? was very active, so he knew that he was Montenegrin. And he answered, uh, uh, not yours. Everybody laughed and he said, Ukraine. And his argument why Ukraine was uh, very difficult to digest also in the light of what you're saying. He was saying uh, wars can end in two ways, either by a victory of one side and a capitulation or the other, or by some sort of a peace agreement. And uh, in this war, he said, uh, one side, meaning nuclear power, Russia cannot capitulate. So it would have to end by a certain compromise. And uh, he didn't go into details of what that compromise be, but everybody could guess that it was a sort of a territorial concession. And uh, the only thing that Ukraine could be offered in exchange for such a poisonous pill would be a full EU membership. That was his argument. I don't know uh, what you're thinking about this first country joining, small Montenegro or the biggest one, as you mentioned as well. Uh, I would also add uh, uh, the important question or dilemma about the war is that wars are not scientific. And uh, the fact that they may in the past have ended this or the other way does not lead us to a conclusion they will follow any of these trajectories uh, in, in, in the upcoming future. An element uh, that is destabilizing this very otherwise uh, co coherent uh, perspective is that we have uh, an active uh, couple of hundred thousand civil society component in Ukraine that will not allow also for um, the political type of processes that otherwise would be um, uh, would be there for the time being. But again, we cannot know that. We don't know what will happen to, in, in, in Russia. I, um, I, however, I'm sympathetic to, you know, I'm, I'm, I kind of embrace the, what, what, um, what I just heard um, because there is a tremendous change in momentum in, in the political realm of Ukraine and however well you may be prepared in terms of, you know, on the process, competences, and Ukraine is nowhere uh, in, in many ways in, in comparison to some other countries. When, when you compare such a process, I mean, Croatia joining is not Ukraine joining in terms of the competences of the country to, uh, to join the European Union, to, 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 to take it uh, this way. But the momentum they have been generating over the past 10 years of the war, and including these two last years of the war effort, with internal reforms, changes, adaptations, adoptions of the EU regulation, changes them fundamentally more than many of the countries that were in the waiting list. They consolidate internally, and they, they, their country is really traveling. It's not staying in one place. It is a country that geographically, of course, is where it is. But in terms of the political identity, political culture, it travels from east to west. And that is something that consolidates around the bloodshed, uh, uh, around the victims on the front lines, and victims who are killed every day in the bombings of, of Russia, and that just consolidates the direction and the position. Therefore, I think uh, Ukraine is one way or another uh, getting into the EU at a much faster speed than many Balkan countries. Thank you, Wojciech. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. Mm -hmm.